Black lives matter. Indigenous lives matter. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, questioning, queer, pansexual, two-spirited, androgynous, and asexual lives matter. Asian lives matter. The lives of the poor matter. The lives of the oppressed matter. Now I'm making a deliberate choice here not to include the phrase white lives matter or the phrase all lives matter. Yes, I know if you are white, if you are wealthy, if you are successful, if you are heterosexual, your life matters. But I believe that there are moments in time when it is vital that we stand in solidarity with particular lives which are being devalued in particular ways. During these days, when those of us who have benefited all our lives from white privilege are beginning to learn the true cost brought to bear on so many lives by systems which by design ensure that some lives in particular matter more than other lives. White, heterosexual, and dare I say it, male lives for generations have benefited from systems created to preserve their place in the matters more column of the way things are simply because that's the way it's always been. This week, two stories collided in my being, leaving me to grapple with my own white privilege. As a preacher, the first story is to be expected. Every three years, the story known as the parable of the talents rolls around and I must do my level best to sort through generations of interpretations which often fail to sound anything at all like gospel to be. According to the parable, a slave master gave talents which represent a huge amount of money to his slaves. That's right, we're talking about a slave master and his slaves. This particular slave master has a reputation for being both harsh and greedy. Now at the time, making money at the expense of others was frowned upon, so slaves were often used to extort money on behalf of their masters. Now the, the first two slaves managed to more than double the master's investment, and the third slave managed to keep the master's initial investment intact, but couldn't quite manage to earn any interest at all. Let's do the math. A talent represents about 15 years of a good salary. Scholars suggest we use a figure of $50,000 per year times 15. That's $750,000 per talent, three quarters of a million dollars per talent. So to the first slave, the master gives five talents. That would be about $3,750,000. To the second slave, the master gave two talents. That's about a million and a half dollars today. To the third slave, the master gave one talent. Remember, that's $750,000, three quarters of a million dollars. When all was said and done, the first two slaves managed to give back to the slave master an additional seven talents. That's a, a whopping great profit of about five and a quarter million dollars. The slave master doesn't seem to care just what kind of methods his two slaves needed to employ in order to make 75% profit on his initial investment. He compliments each one of the profit-making slaves with a well done, good and faithful slave and moves them up on the ladder of success in his carefully crafted system. As for the third slave, who refused to play the master's game and hid the talent for safekeeping and then returned it without having used it to earn further profits for his master, well, he might as well have thrown a monkey wrench into the master's system. And true to form, the slave master condemns the third slave, calling him evil and lazy. Some translations read, lazy and worthless slave. Now, just in case there's any doubt, the slave master declares how the system works. Take the talent from the lazy, worthless slave and give it to the ones who know how to work the system. 
for the one who has will be given more and he will have more than enough. But the one who does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Ain't that the truth? But wait, there's more. The slave master orders his slaves to dish out the consequences the system demands. Throw the worthless slave into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth as I sifted through interpretation after interpretation of this text. I began to see how for generations this parable has been used to perpetuate the very system I believe Jesus was calling out as corrupt. I can't tell you how many theologians and preachers were quick to insist that good and faithful servants ought to use their talents in the service of the church or in the service of Jesus or in the service of God. They simply swapped out the slave master and substituted Jesus or God and suddenly slaves become servants and ipso facto work hard, put your talents to good use, don't worry that it seems like the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. Just give some of the profits to the church and the master, whether it be Jesus or God, will be well pleased and, and you will earn your reward in heaven. Well done, good and faithful servant. You work the system. I said that two stories collided in my life this week. I say collided because it felt like two atoms coming together or being forced together. Life forces, if you will, were smashed together to create an explosion which will continue to reverberate in my being forever. The second story blows the traditional interpretations of the parable of the talents into smithereens. It's an all too common Canadian story which plays itself out in various different ways all over the world. It is the stories of those who have very little and even the little they do have is taken away from them. All too often this is done to benefit those who have more than enough. It's a story about the consequences of an economic system which is designed to profit those who have more than enough. Folks who don't have to get their hands dirty in order to make a profit. This week, members of the Ness Cantaga First Nation came out in the midst of a pandemic to protest. For 25 years, their community, which is 400 kilometers north of Thunder Bay, has been under a boil water order. As if that wasn't bad enough, a couple of months ago, the source of the water they were boiling before it was safe to use developed an oily sheen, forcing the powers that be to evacuate the Ness Cantaga First Nations' most vulnerable residents out of their community. To those who have so very little, even that was taken away from them as the elderly, infants, chronically ill, and school-aged children were forced from their homes. I cannot express to you the kind of wailing and gnashing of teeth which I heard in their cries, but one little boy can. Please watch and listen to young Lyndon Sakani. Children deliver their own message. We're not animals, we're not things, we're human, just like you guys. We, we need your help. Lyndon, you and your neighbors are not animals. You are not things. You are human. Your lives matter. The consequences of systems driven by greed and the hunger for profits are all too often taken for granted by far too many of us who participate in the system and benefit from the system. I do not believe that Jesus of Nazareth, whose life and death bear witness to the cries of the oppressed, the poor, the persecuted, and the suffering, told this parable of the talents so that we could use it to encourage people to work the system. I believe that Jesus told this story to help us understand the kind of courage it takes to refuse to participate in a system as evil as slavery, a system where greed and profits are more important than people's lives. 
I believe that Jesus told this parable to encourage his followers to be as courageous as the third slave, the one who refused to participate in the system to please the powers that be, the one who was prepared to be condemned as lazy and worthless, who was willing to run the risk of being cast out into the darkness. I believe that it is in the darkness where we will meet Christ amongst those who are wailing, tending those who have been judged worthless. I believe that the third slave, like Jesus, like young Lyndon, is challenging us to examine our own participation in corrupt and abusive economic systems which fail to honor the dignity of human life. Yes, refusing to participate in systemic injustice may bring down the judgment of the powers that be upon our heads. But there are other stories to tell. Stories about light. Stories about joy. Stories about feasts and celebrations. Jesus didn't earn a reputation as a glutton and a drunkard for nothing. Lord knows the Nescontaga nation longs for the day when they can join the celebrations. But in order for the light to shine in the darkness, we must follow Christ to tend the wounds of those whose lives have been tossed aside, for they are not worthless. Their lives matter. Lyndon's life matters. Indigenous lives matter. We all know there are others who are wailing and many who are gnashing their teeth. Black lives matter. Indigenous lives matter. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, questioning, queer, pansexual, two-spirited, androgynous, and asexual lives matter. Asian lives matter. The lives of the poor matter. The lives of the oppressed matter. Yes, your life matters. Our privilege comes at great cost. The thing about parables is that they are designed to turn our perceptions upside down and inside out. Do we have the courage to turn our privilege upside down and inside out? Do we have the courage to refuse to participate in systemic corruption? Do we have the courage to be judged, to be cast out, to venture out into the darkness where we will hear the cries of those whose lives matter? Do we have the courage to make our own lives matter, to embody the love which the world so desperately needs? The thing about courage is that it is born out of vulnerability. May the love which is the divine mystery open us all so that we might be vulnerable to the cries of those whose lives matter. Let it be so, dear ones. Let it be so. We hope that you have found this broadcast to be of value to you at this time. To continue to offer these, we depend on the support of donors. If you wish to help to keep us going, please donate what feels right for you via Canada Helps to Holy Cross Lutheran Church Newmarket. Peace be with you.